I've got quite the dynamic duo for you guys today talking relationships with John and Catherine Gordon. Um, if you're unfamiliar with John and Catherine, I am very, very pleased to introduce them to you. <laughs> they keep it so real. If you're tired of couples like being fake and trying to project perfection and you want to hear real, this episode's for you. And they have so many amazing insights to share. We're talking about their book that they co-authored called Relationship Grit. Oh man, <laughs> they were so vulnerable in this book. It, it's so amazing. Like to, it's so refreshing, honestly, to see couples talking about all the personal struggles they've had within relationships, the couple, the struggles they've had together and how they've overcome those and have been married for, I think over 26 years, they said now. So let me tell you a little bit about these amazing people. So John is a bestselling author and keynote speaker. Um, he has many bestselling books. Um, he's a worldwide renowned speaker. He has taught principals to numerous fortune 500 companies, professional and college sports teams, school districts, hospitals, nonprofits. Um, he is the author of 24 books and 12 of those are bestsellers, including, uh, five children's books. Uh, his books include the timeless classic, the energy bus, which has sold over 2 million copies, which we talk about a little bit toward the end of the show. Um, and you know, some of his leadership books are training camp, the power of positive leadership, the power of positive team. Um, so many, uh, John's amazing. If you don't follow him on Instagram, highly recommend it. Um, and I will link all of this in the show notes for you guys so you can find them. Um, he is also a graduate of Cornell and has a master's in teaching from Emory University. Yeah, John's amazing. Catherine is kind of my girl. I love her. We're both Virginia natives. We just, we just click. Um, and I actually was recently on her new podcast called Catherine for real, which is like the perfect name for her. <laughs> she is, she just keeps it real. I love it so much. Um, but yeah, she's a wife, mother, businesswoman, movie producer, and bestselling author of Relationship Grit, and of course, the host of that podcast. And I'll put links to her podcast, John's podcast, all their social media stuff. I'll link all that up in the show notes. So make sure you check that. And um, yeah, we're going to talk relationships today. We're going to keep it real with the Gordon. So let's go ahead and dive in. This is John and Catherine Gordon. All right. So I was just telling John and Catherine before we started, this is the first episode that we've had about relationships. And I'm super excited to have you guys come and talk about your book relationship grit. I read the whole thing. I have to say, I am like blown away by how vulnerable and real you guys are in this book. It's so refreshing, honestly. And, um, I know Catherine, you've started your new podcast, Catherine for real. And it's like, yes, exactly. You guys are keeping it real. Like you're not holding back. You're not trying to make yourselves look good, especially John. I feel like you just really, <laughs> you're like, yep, this is how it went down. And this is what we learned through that process. And it's such a breath of fresh air, because I think, you know, what we see on social media right now is look at our perfect relationship. And so then when yours doesn't match that, it's like, well, mine must be freaking horrible because it doesn't look like that. And so I, my first question for you guys on this book is what are the key things that you guys learned about yourself from the beginning of your marriage and not to give, you know, spoiler alert, you guys should get the book. Um, we'll link it in the show notes, but it wasn't super hunky dory <laughs> in the beginning, you know, and you guys are in a completely different space now. So what are, I want each of you to share, what are the key things that you learned about yourself that you needed to see in order to make the relationship more successful? Well, I mean, you know, we all come to our relationships with baggage, right? Yeah. So um, I was always, um, if things don't work out, I'm out of here, you know? And so it was really easy for me to just shut down and check out. And John was really the first one to be like, no, 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 you're actually scared. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn a lot about myself and, and, and the fears and anxieties. And again, all the baggage I had from before. And yeah. so we were a work in progress. We definitely had to go to therapy. And I think you read in the book, you know, of course the therapist says I went from zero to 60, just like that. Two seconds. <laughs> Two seconds. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was just learning a lot about our personalities and what we bring to the relationship. Yeah. yeah. And I think for me, I had to learn a lot about myself. I mean, I really became a different person. I was 24 mm -hmm. when I met Catherine. So I was like just a young boy, right? Not even a, a man yet. And so didn't know how to be in a relationship, never really had a great relationship. And now I'm in one, Catherine would make me communicate when I didn't want to communicate, but I learned how to be a better 
communicator, learned about commitment, worked through a lot of the issues that I had from abandonment and things like that, no doubt about that. And it's so funny though, because people will read this book and they'll be like, John, I hated you in the beginning of this book. Like I'm reading this going, I don't like this guy. And even my own brother said, are you sure you want this book out there? Because people have this opinion of you based on your best-selling books that they've read, your positive books, and they love your optimism, your positivity. And now they see a complete other side of you. And I said, you know, people need to know yeah. what I was like to know how I changed to know that they can change, mm -hmm. to know that you can change the relationship. You can get better for your partner, for your spouse. And so that was what I learned is that I could get better. I could grow. I can become the best version of myself in the relationship. I also learned that you heal the most the relationship. I really believe we come to a relationship with our wounds, mm -hmm. with our baggage, but the relationship is where you heal. We often hear, I have to work on myself. I have to work on myself, but I believe that you work most and you heal most in a loving relationship that is committed where the other person says, I'm not going anywhere and we're going to heal and work this out. But I always had a lot of fear that Catherine was going to go somewhere. And I think she had the fear of, of that with me. And I think that's a common thing that many relationships have to work out is this fear, this insecurities, lack of trust. We're so often betrayed in our relationships. So it's really hard to trust. That's what makes it so hard. But when you do, you find the joy and the reward of a great relationship, but you have to be willing to maybe even have your heart broken mm -hmm. in order to have the special relationship that you're meant to have. Right. Yeah. I love that you highlighted this fear of, I can't share anything negative about myself because then people might judge me, might ruin my reputation. I'm going to lose my whole business. Like, you know, all these huge fears come out and then people project them to us too. Like your brother's like, uh Oh, better not do that. This fear that we already have this fear of what other people will think. And I think it's a primal instinct of like not wanting to be excluded from the herd, you know? And so what I, what I take that as is it takes a tremendous amount of confidence and courage. And that courage comes from the confidence of knowing that you've healed, knowing that you've changed and having the desire to say, Hey, like it's possible to have shown up like this in life and to it, go through a healing process and show up differently, you know? And so I just think it, it shows your own level of confidence and the healing that you've experienced that you're willing to share like, Hey, yeah, I went down that road that happens. I was 24 years old. I didn't know a lot and I've learned and evolved and grown. And I think, um, I love that you were talking about growing inside of a relationship and because I, you know, even as a mindset coach, like I have multiple mindset coaches because they have, they hold up this mirror of like, here's the stuff you're not seeing. And I know that I trust them and they trust me. It's a safe, loving space, but it's like, it's hard to see all your own stuff. Cause it just feels like reality to you. And that kind of brings us to what you guys both hit on a little bit is communication. Mm -hmm. So we hear about, you know, great, great relationships need communication, but like when it comes down to it, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say things like, well, I didn't want to say anything. Cause like, I didn't want to hurt their feelings or like, oh, I can't say anything to her. She'll just blow up. Or, I can't say anything to him. because he'll freak out, you know? And so then these wedges come, can you guys speak on the lessons you've learned in communication through the school of hard knocks? I got this one. <laughs> um, and you can expound on yeah. it because what I was going to say is one of my favorite quotes of John's is where there's a void in communication, negativity will fill it. Mm. How many times do you think your partner is thinking something only to find out that they weren't, mm. but you come up with this whole thing in your head. Yeah. And so it is so important. And it was hard to get John to communicate early on. I just am a natural communicator. And I had done a lot of therapy before I got into relationship with John. So that definitely helped me mm -hmm. see things a little more clearly. Um, but I mean, I had to fight to get him to communicate and kind of figure out ways to do it. And I mean, early on, there were all kinds of different things happening, but one of the things we do now as a couple, and we've done, you know, raising our kids is taking that time. If it's a walk, if mm -hmm. it's at night, just in, 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 you know, laying in the bed and just having the conversation, just making sure you carve out that time. And I'm going to tell you, mm -hmm. we would take these walks on the beach and they weren't always fun. I mean, I, we would fight. I'm going to be honest. A lot of times it was me going at John <laughs> and he'd go, this isn't very fun. 
but I had to get it out. But then by the end of the walk, everything was fine. And so you really have to push for that communication. And, and I think we take advantage of the fact that our partner's just there you know, and we have to communicate with, you know, our coworkers or our, the, you know, people you're coaching or that's a part of your business or that's right. a part, of, but we don't do it as much with our own partners. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's an effort. And I think it's mm-hmm. number one because you have to communicate. It builds trust, builds the relationship, connection. creates the connection. You will never have right. connection without the communication. The communication begins the process of connection yeah. and also Communication is not just talking, it's also listening. Mm-hmm. And you really have to listen to what each other is, is saying because mm-hmm. they have issues, they have challenges. And when you hear and you listen, then you can have understanding. And that understanding really allows you to hear the other person's point of view and, and where they're coming from. But this is years of being together, right? Mm-hmm. 26 years now total, 24 together. So we now laugh a lot about our our stuff more than anything where for years we just fought and there was a lot of fighting in terms of misunderstandings mm-hmm. and again me saying something stupid and hurting your feelings always saying something stupid. yeah and so i would say things and but then talking about it afterwards but i can count on one hand the amount of times i slept on a couch maybe five mm-hmm. you know <laughs> five times on a couch so we rarely went to bed angry and kept it going we would talk and sometimes stay up late talking to work it out like we both didn't just let it fester i think the more you let it fester i see couples do that they don't communicate they let it fester then they wind up basically take go to their corner Mm -hmm. the other person goes to the other corner and now they're not communicating they're not connecting there's a divide between the two Mm -hmm. and then it's really hard to recover from that and you wind up protecting yourselves mm-hmm. instead of investing in the relationship. Relationship has to be first. That's why we talk about shared vision and mission in the book. Like, what's our vision? What's our mission? If we know it's to have a great relationship, then we'll both do the things necessary yeah. for the relationship. So even in the fights, you're going to make sure that, okay, what's our common goal? The relationship. All right, let's yeah. do that. Even now with friends, with everything going on in the world, going on in the world, friends and I will fight about different, you know, things happening, right? Debates on different topics, right? But we always remember we're friends first, and we've known each other since college. Let's remain friends and not let this discussion escalate to the point where it hurts the yeah. relationship. And I can honestly say we've had debates, but we still have great friendships, and it's the same thing in, in our marriage. You know, I think one of the the unfortunate things now is that with social media and, you know, everything being at the ready, it's really easy to sw- keep swiping, you know, like I, I'm going to try this person, I'm going to go on a date with them. And this is what I'm hearing from a lot of my friends at date now. Um, you know, it's so easy to just think, well, what's next? Instead of really embracing where you are and committing and making, you know, making it a commitment to work on the relationship you're in. And again, I always say, and I say it in the book, now, if you're being verbally abused or physically abused or, you know, dealing with a narcissist or, you know, anything like that, that's different. But just this whole, like, everything's so quick and instant and fast and at the ready is, is, is really hard for people dating now. And so it does take that commitment of saying, you know what? We're going to make this work. We're going to, we're going to try to really commit to working through our issues and talking it out. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, it takes two. You yeah. both yeah. have to make the commitment to invest in the relationship. You can't consume. You both have to say, we're going to invest. And if one's committed and the other isn't, mm-hmm. it's not going to work out. The great news is we've had couples reach out to us since this book's been out and they are now staying married. They were getting divorced. Yep. We had one couple getting divorced, getting the paper signed that week. They read the book. They decided to commit to the relationship and they sent us a picture on their family vacation going on, going on it together. So those are the couples we want to say where, where they should stay together, but they don't because of an issue, because of miscommunication, because of bitterness over time, or they finally get to a point where they've had enough or whatever it may be, but they should still continue to work it out. We believe that in some cases, you know, Maybe they shouldn't, but you should do everything you can to make it work and try. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Go ahead, dear. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just. Well, gonna say- I was just gonna say. I mean, the hardest years. You know, one when you're getting together and then everything's great, 
And then, you know, fast forward, however many months and things start going, you know, your, your stuff starts rearing its head. So you get through that, you get married then you have kids. Those are the hardest times. And I tell people that are in it, in the grind, they're running their kids, the sports and they're, if you can get through this period, if you really love that person and you can get through it, if you guys can really commit, it really, you'll get to the other side and you'll look back. I mean, it is amazing. You know, the blessings that come from that, you know, but again, takes commitment, takes the commitment to wanting to stay together. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you guys highlighted, um, fear around communication and that that communication is actually what connects you the most. And I I've seen this so often. I, you know, observe this in myself and many of my clients that, you know, friends it's, I don't want to bring it up because I'm afraid that that will actually push us further away. If I speak my truth in the relationship, but the opposite always happens. At least now you're playing on the same level. At least now, you know what the other person is experiencing. And I am especially interested, um, with your, from your point of view, John, because you have that abandonment core wound. Right. And so I know like when you have an abandonment wound, it definitely is like, I'll just, whatever you want. Uh, I don't want to speak anything that might upset you because then you'll leave me, you know? And so can you talk about like the, the, like what that looked like in practicality of you getting past this, like, not going to say anything, not going to say anything and being able to speak and connect. Well, for me, it actually wasn't not say anything. My wound made me say a lot. It made me almost mm-hmm. lash out, mm-hmm. but you're right. In couples, a lot of times what happens is we want to remain in like, but we never move to love because we don't want to mm-hmm. rock the boat. So mm-hmm. we never move to a level of intimacy. You need to uncover what is covered. Mm -hmm. If you don't uncover it, eventually it will be uncovered and won't be good. And so when you uncover it, you bring it to the light, you allow healing to take place. And so you have to uncover it. So my wounds were causing me to lash out, to be jealous, to be, Mm. you know, worried that she was going to leave me to be insecure. And then it would make me not like uh, abusive mean, but just like mean and almost like say things to her to make myself feel better right Mm -hmm. i might put her down to make myself feel better because i was actually jealous but also catherine when younger she you know had a flirty personality and so and she's gorgeous so right she's very pretty and (laughs) and and flirty and so that didn't make it easier for me as well like i always say like you know like you may here i was 24 year old guy insecure all these issues it only exacerbated the problems right tell her what happened what in the elevator (laughs) Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll find out later, Catherine. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll text oh, you. Well, you can tell her. Yeah, tell her. Yeah, tell her. Well, tell her. Let's give the audience funny. something well, like, like real. I mean, that, yeah, this, this isn't is, in the book. So, hey, you get me in the real. real. This is real. Yeah, let's get real, Catherine. For so, real. Let's get real. So, I don't John and I had started dating. And by the way, back in the day, um, I was, I used to work out really, really hard in the gym and I was following all Corey Everson stuff. And I was definitely buff. And, um, <laughs> what did I? and, um, so hard, hard body, hard body. And so <laughs> John, I had seen an old friend of mine. It was a guy that I worked with, you know, whatever, whatever. And John got so jealous. We got in the elevator and he turns to me and he goes, you know, you need to work out more. I looked at him and I was like, don't you ever say that to me again. And, you know, he never forgot that. I mean, I just was like, but it's about setting those rules and setting those boundaries. And you know what? You teach people how to treat you. Yeah. Yeah. And so that has to start from the get-go. Yeah. And it made me <laughs> scared of her forever after that. <laughs> and so, she was buff. You know, you I watch just out. added an F, an F in there as well. Well, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, don't, and don't ever say that to me again. I was like, ooh, all right. But I got, you know, again, insecure, jealous. So it caused me to be that way but what happened is over time you know going to counseling also getting married having kids the more we were in it the more the more i realized she wasn't going anywhere and that really you know helped me stay in the relationship but what happened was my insecurities also you know led to a little infidelity you know in our relationship early on 20 8, 29, 30 years old, right? 
And so you're, you're doing these stupid things because you're insecure. You're looking outside the marriage for satisfaction because, and for, for validation, because you're not getting it from your wife. You have small children. She's so busy with that. And you're the last person getting attention. And this is what happens to guys a lot early in the marriage. Yeah. The woman has kids and now the guy is not getting any attention. And he then starts looking outside because he's not secure in his, himself. Right. He has issues and hasn't worked them out. And I look back on that and no excuses, you know, definitely a, a, a bad mood, a, a bad move, a wrong move. I became a person of faith, you know, a few years later, that changed everything for me, who I was, how I approached the world, how I acted more loving, more service oriented, more committed, more, more everything, recognizing my own flaws. And then as I did that work, those issues started yeah. to go away forgiveness of my biological father who who did abandon and forgiveness there and forgiveness of people who may have wronged me that was helpful it doesn't happen overnight right it takes a while to do the work but you've got to do the work and focus on your healing shame and guilt is inflammation of the soul yes yeah. and so you've got to have the forgiveness and the love and the light to remove the inflammation of shame and guilt yeah. so that you can allow real healing to take place yeah. And I appreciate you being so open and vulnerable about that. Right. Cause I'm, I am divorced and I'm in a, a Facebook group and it's, it's wonderful. And it's a lot of divorced people just keeping it real and talking about the path and healing and all that stuff. And, <laughs> um, I've noticed, you know, there was a post one time it had hundreds and hundreds of comments and it said, just curious why you guys got divorced. And I mean, I would say, I mean, at least probably at least 70% of these were, I, they cheated on me. They cheated on me. And you know how many comments were I cheated on them? Zero. Zero, zero, zero. So I learned from that. I actually really like this group because I learn about a lot about human psychology from it. And I'm like, wow. So no one is talking about the people who cheat. Like no one's talking about the psychology that goes behind that. It's just shamed. You're a bad person. You're a jerk. Nobody likes you. And that shame keeps them in that low vibration and nobody heals. And so I appreciate wow. you talking about no one makes a choice like that without there being some pain that got them into that place of deep, deep insecurity where they feel it's like a drug to them, you know? And so I appreciate you be, being open about that. And also talking about, yes, you can heal from that. And there is something wrong. If you are in that boat, if that's you right now and you're cheating and you're living in that shame cycle, you need healing and it's okay. Like give yourself a big old hug and start on that healing love path. And I love how you call it inflammation of the soul. Exactly. And the only thing that can heal is like a big old vitamin C and it's love and compassion and empathy and understanding and getting to that place of healing. I'm curious, Catherine, from your end of things, because you're right. You're right, John. I, I, I so first of all, if you guys don't follow John on social media, like I love all your stuff. You just nail it like personal <laughs> development wizard. Like it's so, so good. And so when I was reading this, I was like, what? No way, no way. The first half of the book. And I, as I was reading it and it, you know, I know Catherine a little bit personally. So it was just, it, it was an interesting take. And so I was wondering, Catherine, how, I feel like sometimes what happens is when a, a partner shows up the way John was showing up early in the relationship, it's held against them forever, right? It's this like, they won't, the other partner won't let it go. It's like, no, you were like that to me and see, oh, doing it again, you know, this kind of energy. How did you let that go? Because you can't, there's no way you guys could be in a healthy space. If you're just like, yep, doing that again and pointing fingers. How'd you get past that? How did you heal with him? How did you forgive? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, sometimes he jokes that he's still paying for it, but <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, Keeping you know it real what? again. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, first of all, I came from a, a family where my father was a huge womanizer and I had issues with that and had pledged. My mom wasn't able to leave the marriage. And so my big thing was to be make sure that I was secure financially, um, emotionally, mentally, you know, to never, ever put myself in that situation. And yeah. then it happened. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you, I got to give John a lot of credit. He never gave up. When I say that, I mean, I, I, I persecuted him. I really mm -hmm. did because I was in so much pain. And by the way, I'm the one that should have been the cheater 
I'm the one that's like sexually open. I'm just going to tell you that <laughs> I am. I mean, it's that, you know, and then here. <laughs> well, you have to explain what you mean by that. Though. Well, I mean, <laughs> just, you know. Not the other relationships. Are well, no, but like, you know, I, I, I would have been the cheater, but I wasn't. <laughs> and, you know, when I found out it was him, I was like, what? <laughs> and so I persecuted him. I persecuted him. I, I, I continued to ask questions over and over. I drilled him. He, no matter what, continued to answer any question I had, continued to show up for me. He also came up with a family pr or a prayer, which we talk about in the book yeah. and would say that prayer over every night. It didn't matter if he was traveling, he would call me. Um, he would leave notes all over the house. You're beautiful. And he just continued to show me. And apologize. Well, mm -hmm. the apology was there, but he just never stopped because because I wasn't going to let it go. I mean, I tried to cheat on him. I tried to get him back and it didn't work. It was the weirdest thing how, you know, God, I feel like kept kept me from all that just because I was in pain. Yeah. Um, and so it was funny uh, or not funny, but I think between his prayers and his consistency and his communication of the fact that he was sorry and totally committed to me and loved me more than anything. Um, uh, one night, as I talk about in the book, he sang the prayer and I actually said it out loud with him and that it was like something just lifted. And I was able to say, I love this man and I want to stay with him, and we're going to make it work. Mm. And that's when the real work began. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I love your, uh, your, your intention, right? You have set an intention and a mutual goal and it's beautiful. What can happen in that space? It's just, you know, it's similar to business. It's like, I know where I'm going. So like whatever has to happen in the meantime, whatever personal growth I have to go through, whatever I attract in, you know, <laughs> like I, it doesn't matter. Like this is where we're going. And it's cool to see that with you guys, because, I, you're right. I think a lot of um, dysfunction in relationships happen because people can leave, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it, all this people pleasing and weird behaviors come out out of fear. And so you guys have removed that fear. It's like that's not happening. So now we can heal because fear is not running the show, which is really. And we've cool. been and we've been transparent, always transparent about things. You know, even sharing this. Like, so this happened. Like, you know, the latest when I was. 30, 31. And then I told her though, when I was 40. And so it had been some years when I told her, so there was some time and I was holding on to it and living with it. And I didn't tell her out of guilt. I told her because I knew there was something between us that was keeping us from being truly connected as a, in a relationship. And after I told her and we worked through this one part, you know, everything became so much better. Our relationship became mm -hmm. so much stronger after that. Here I am now 50, about to be 51. So 10, 11 years after I told her, you know, and, and all of this, I want to make it clear. I mean, this doesn't matter for general because sin is sin and still doing the cheating is still cheating, but I didn't go to the final extreme of closing the deal. I should say, whatever it you might be. I didn't have sex. Yeah. <laughs> and not to say that like that's so, but, you know, it, doesn't but it, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, it was yeah. one, like the, the, the last situation and we didn't write in the, we share this in the book, but like I was in a situation I should have been in and I, and I walked out and I left and something like, I rem I remember thinking, cause it, it was going to happen. I said, this is not my wife. I can't do this. And I left. And when I left, I said to myself, I will never put myself in a situation like that ever again. And I already had made that commitment to her and to myself that I wouldn't do that. So by the time I told her, I had been walking the walk. That's when I, again, I started writing these books. I started speaking everywhere. My career is going through the roof and taking off. I was already living the right way for a long time, doing the work and being committed. So when I told her, I was telling her, but that still didn't matter for her because when she heard it, it was like it happened yesterday. Right. You know, it didn't matter. And so for me, here I am being persecuted for something I did when I wasn't even that guy anymore. And yet I'm being right. like, like thinking my marriage is going to end now from what the stupid guy did, you know, 12, 11 years ago, 10 years ago. And now I'm paying for it now. So it was like this weird situation and feeling to be in. But for couples where it has happened and the deal hasn't been closed and they, you know, that happened, 
you can still heal. There is still forgiveness possible. No matter what, it's still betrayal. And you just have to work through that, that betrayal. And Catherine forgiving me was a huge part. And really, she did forgive me. And she saw the man I had become. And she understood. Yeah. And I told her everything. And that's the other thing. You have to be transparent. You have to be honest. Because mm -hmm. you got to bring it to the light for the healing. And yeah. once I did, right, I had no, I had no, um, I had no, nothing in the closet. I had nothing to hide. Like everything was, was put out there. Here it is. Yeah. Nothing to hide. Here you go. And that allows you to really get connected and then become more committed as you move forward. I want to hone in on this for a second. Cause I know this is so common. I actually have a friend going through this right now. This juxtaposition of someone has been unfaithful. They've hidden it for many years. They tell their partner, they feel a huge sense of relief because they've been carrying this cross for a decade or something similar to this many years, but for the partner, this is new information and devastating. So what a juxtaposition of emotions, how, what advice would you guys give? And Catherine, I want to hear yours too, but what advice, how do you navigate that? That's so difficult, right? <laughs> like it's, and you nailed it on the head, John, with the, you're like, I'm not that person though anymore. This is a long time ago, but shoot. And she's like, all of a sudden I'm feeling like you're that person because you just <laughs> told me, you know? So yeah. yeah how do you navigate? Well, what do you guys I recommend? Mean, the first thing was like, did you really have to tell me, you know, <laughs> oh, like wow. I almost was like, Wow. Oh my gosh. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, and anybody I told, you know, they'd be like, why did he tell you that? <laughs> I mean, of course I was glad he did. Right. But it's like, it just <laughs> rocked my world. I think again, communication, transparency, sit down and really think to yourself, if you have to write it out, the pros and cons, what are the pro pros of staying with this person? What are the cons? Do you want to stay with them? And if you do, you need to come up with a game plan. And it involves a lot of trust and transparency. Listen, I, I checked his phone. I would check his email. He had to let me do all that. And yeah. I don't even know if a therapist would say that was okay, but it actually helped me. And it got me yeah. to a point to where I didn't feel the need to do that anymore. And it was his behavior what are you laughing at? Because you can check it anytime, anywhere. I, I laugh. But <laughs> she still will sometimes look, and it doesn't. I get to me, it doesn't matter. You can look at anything I'm doing. Well, that, I'm really but, just oh, nosy. And, at and that also, point. Oh, I'm also laughing at the fact that. But uh, she did say, "Well, I, I get half of the company." Like I. That's him, right. Yeah, and I said, like, "So when that I, happened, <laughs> I said I want fifty percent of the company," and he said, "Okay." Yeah. And we went to an attorney. And I got 50%. I didn't think you could have whatever. It didn't matter. You could have a hundred percent. But that is true. Yeah. Is it? I know that's, I was like, you know what? He does this to me again. At least I know I'm set. So. <laughs> no, it was, it was just yeah. Because of the betrayal, she wanted some level well, of what commitment. It, what it was, yeah. was we were already yeah. re reorganizing some of the business oh, yeah. and it was going to be 40, 60. Yeah. So when that happened, I go 50, 50. And he was like, okay. I think you, you were looking for safety, you know, Absolutely. and it, yeah. that's my yeah. biggest thing. I mean, yeah. it has been my biggest thing. Remember I'm telling you, know, I went back to my mom and watching her not be able to get out of a bat. Right. That was number one. And when he did that, that rocked everything for me. And I, and so many times though, like a lot of couples fight over finances and things like that, but and we did <laughs> early on, but, early no, on. But, but in terms of control and all that, like Catherine has control of the finances more than even me, right? Like she could have it all. Like I would always say, you can have everything. It doesn't matter. I said, you can have it all. I said, but if you're the one who cheats on me, then I'm just going to stop speaking for money. Said, I'm, I'm going to stop working. I'm going to stop working. <laughs> I'm, like that's it. If, if, if you're the one who does that, like I'll speak for nonprofits and just never charge a dime. So you're not going to live off of me work, you know, oh, doing God. all this work. But, but, you know, I have to say like, if Catherine was the one who would have done what I did, like, I don't know if we would have been together because I don't know if I was, uh, I don't think I could have forgiven. No, I don't think he could. I don't think I could forgive that. No, I couldn't. Maybe handle. now. No, maybe now. No. 15, no. You have something to tell me? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be the, the biggest camera. episode ever. <laughs> yeah. I have, uh, if, 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 um, if I, if it happened to me, yeah, I don't think I could have. And so I do have to admire, you know, the people that are able to move through, through that forgiveness and through that obstacle and through that hurt, through that betrayal. So yeah, yeah hardest thing we, we ever had to do was overcome that. But again, out of good, I mean, out of bad turns good. Mm -hmm. We made this like 
the best thing that we ever did for our relationship because it became our connection point, a defining moment in our relationship. We truly yeah. became stronger after that as a result of this. No doubt about it. Something else came yeah. from that, Tara. Um, you know, John, gosh, the year before COVID did 85 speaking against that he traveled to 85 speaking events. He came up with very hard and fast rules for himself. What are you laughing at? Okay. On what he was going to do, right? So that meant, you know, no, because, you know, women would say, hey, can we get together and talk about the energy bus? Or, can, you know, can you have coffee? I mean, there's a lot of that. Right. No, no, you yeah. didn't do it. Right. I said, women would ask you. Right. <laughs> and he just became very, very clear on this is what I don't do. I don't go to bars when I'm at hotels. I don't. Yeah. You know, so he, I think it almost set us up. I don't want to say that it happened because of that. Because I, I had already been doing that the whole, all the whole time since I made Do you want to fight about this no, right you wanna, now? Are you? <laughs> so, so Kat, Kat, you know, we, we, we can actually fight about relationship grit right now. No, I had already, <laughs> I already done that the whole time I was speaking. The whole time I had become a, you know, when I became a person of faith. I was not doing that all along. No, That's we knew I, you weren't, but no, I'm no, saying- No, no, but I never was going to hotel bars, any of right, that. Right, but and I'm saying you had rules. I had rules, but it, yeah. it didn't start after I told you. It started years before when I made the decision that I would never put myself in a situation right. like that again. I had already been doing the work. I had already been committed. I already been faithful. So, so the person like who wrote these books, right? I only wrote these books and started doing this work after all of that happened, like after yeah. I had made that commitment, it was almost like I could have never been blessed to do it or been someone who could do it right. if I was still living that life and doing that. Right. Once I in myself figured it out and knew I wouldn't do it. And then again, surrendered, trusted, became a person of faith. That's when, again, I started to change. And then all these years I was living the right way. But when I, when I told her I didn't change, we changed. Yeah. That's when we became committed and connected after that. We truly became stronger. Yeah. But what do you say when you talk about like maybe, you know, we talk about this was probably something that had to happen. Oh, it had to happen. Oh, yeah. It so had explain to happen. that because yeah. maybe I didn't explain yeah, it. Yeah. Right no, the reason why, you know, looking back, the reason why it had to happen for me was I had to know what would happen if I, you know, did that later on in my life. Like I wasn't successful. And so, if I would have been someone who would allow this to happen as a author and all of a sudden speaking on stages and you're surrounded by people, women, women, you, you could then fall and you see a lot of leaders yeah. do that. You see them yeah. make decisions. So I had to develop the character to yeah. not allow that to happen. So now when I'm speaking and I had 5,000 women right. at an event, right, right. And I'm signing books. I am seeing them as sisters. I'm seeing them as, as women right. who I value and recognize, not someone who might be interested in me or that I might do that with. I had become a, I had to have that happen to know where it could lead and to know that it would never happen again. So it was actually a blessing. Yeah. It really, I mean, again, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to try to say like, oh, this is why you should do it. It was prepared I learned, you. I learned from it, yeah, prepared me, prepared me to now be a person of honor and faith in yeah. this relationship. So by the time I was speaking all over, again, I was, I was not worried. I didn't need accountability partner. People talk about accountability partners all the time. And mm -hmm. you know, my good friend Erwin McManus said it best. He said accountability partners don't work. Because if you're going to lie to yourself, you'll, you'll also lie to your accountability partner. Amen. Wow. Amen. I, yeah, I don't. And, and the energy of that is so it, small. It, like, it, I feel like it makes the other person so small, right. you know, it's like, yes. it doesn't breed trust at all. And I love that you, what you were saying about like how a lot of what you teach now was born out of the healing from so yeah. much of this pain. Cause like, you can't, like, if you're doing personal development, you just don't have anything to say, in my opinion, unless you've kind of hit a dark night of the soul and pulled yourself out of that crap. That's where you learn all your juice. Cause you're like, this matters. This is what pulled me into the light out of the darkness, you know? So the whole path makes sense, you know, and it's beautiful, Catherine, that you supported him through that, you know? And yeah, I, I, for women who are listening or men too, plenty of men who have been cheated on. It's funny how we, we think it's only, you know, the men get more of the stigma, but it's more, I think being divorced is an interesting perspective to be in. So I was married for 13 years. I've been divorced for about five. So pretty much anyone I've dated has been married and divorced, um, you know, friends who have been divorced. It's really interesting to see, um, 
how much commonality happened in those paths, so, you know, like the lack of communication, the infidelity, the, um, the infidelity spurred out of low self-esteem, um, insecurity, needing validation, you know, and I I'd say what you've chosen, the path you've chosen, Catherine is rare. You know, that's a, it's a rare, at least from my personal experience in life for someone to stick with it. And so you've mentioned something like you asked yourself, do I want to stay with this person, you know, and can you walk us through like where you, why, you know, like where, where was your heart and soul at in that moment? Well, um, up, up to that point, I would have told you, I would have never stayed. You know, I always said that I'll, I'll never tolerate that, but you know, it's interesting what happens when you're really in the relationship yeah. and yeah, I, I had to sit down and really think about this do I love this man? Can I get over this? You know, we had children. I mean, it was a process. Um, yeah. I did go to therapy. Yeah. I went to therapy and, and tried to work through it that way, but a lot of it did end up boiling down to just me sitting down and talking to God mm. and, and thinking, mm. okay, I, I I love him and, and I want to work through this. And what does that look like? And I also think my background and my upbringing had something to do with it. I mean, I did come from a, an alcoholic, uh, home, but it was a very loving home, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. but things would happen at night. Um, you know, like my dad, they, my mom and dad would get drunk and my dad would, you know, beat my mom up or whatever. And then we would wake up in the morning and I just wanted everything to be okay. And so mm. I would, you know, snap out of it and boom. And, and I'm, I'm not saying, you know, stuff your feelings or mm -hmm. look the other way. So I don't mean it like that, but I learned, you know, to, I guess, kind of let things slide off my back a little bit to be, a, to, to be okay. Yeah. And when I say that again, I, I have done therapy on it. So I'm probably, I may not be explaining it right, but it's not about sweeping things under the rug. It's about what can you tolerate? What yeah. can, what can change and what do you want going forward? Yeah. You know what, happens I, to, what happens to a lot of times in couples, they come to a point, we meet a lot of people in their forties and fifties who are now getting divorced. And I believe you reach this moment where you say, do I want to be with this person for the rest of my life? Like, do I envision my life going forward? And a lot of times the man will say no, or the woman will say no. It's like, no, I do not see this person as my future. And I think that's one of the big decisions you have to make is do mm -hmm. I see this person as part of my future? I think mm -hmm. it happens a lot. I've noticed it turning 50. It's more women who, a lot of women who are saying, I'm done with this, raise my kids. And that's kind of sad because you know what, if you really can come together. So I don't know. But the guy didn't invest in the relationship. Right, he wasn't right. supportive. He was mm -hmm. going to do his own thing all the time. He never really valued and appreciated you. And you almost got to continue to date. You almost have to, mm -hmm. as I'm a sports guy, you have to continue to recruit your, you know, you have to recruit your wife to, to remind her why she is married to you. You know, you got to take her out. You got to make her a priority. Mm -hmm. You got to make that focus. You got to enjoy being together and you got to, yeah. again, invest in the relationship. It doesn't happen by accident. You have to, as Catherine says, always compliment, mm -hmm. you know, the other person, make them right. feel valued, make them feel loved, make them feel appreciated. You stop doing those things mm -hmm. and the person's not going to want to be in a relationship. So we take each other for granted. And I think yeah. that's a key part. So Catherine had to make that decision. Do I want to be with him? And of course I knew I wanted to be with, with her and would do anything possible. And so when, when she, um, was almost going to divorce me from that, I'm like, no, I cannot allow this to happen. And I was willing to do whatever, you know, a lot of apologies, yeah. a lot of, um, a lot of, um, you know, just serve so service, a lot of serving, service. a lot of serving, but I, I want to talk about that. Yeah. So there's two things there. One of them. And I think I talked about this in the book, you know, um, especially when you're in the rut, you know, you've got these kids, you're raising these kids, you're trying, you know, taking them to sports. John was traveling all the time and it was really hard for me to take care of myself. Yeah. I didn't have the discipline, you know, that some people do. So I, I'm ADD. It was very easy for me to just, and so I had a really hard time. And so I wasn't consistent with taking care of me, taking care yeah. of my health. I gained weight, you know, just wasn't feeling good. 
And so, you know, one particular day, John walks in the door um, in the, into the kitchen and he's getting ready to take off for a flight. Um, he looked so handsome. I mean, and John is the <laughs> most disciplined man besides Tara Garrison I've ever met in my she's life. A female, a female, she's a, she's a female dis yeah. disciplined person. Um, he is the consistency. And so, you know, he just looked great and handsome and I'm standing there, my hair's disheveled. I feel awful. <laughs> and I looked at him and I wanted to cut him down. I wanted to say something to make him feel bad about himself. And I knew right then it was because I didn't feel good about me. Yeah. And so I made a decision right then to actually compliment him. And I turned to him and I said, you look so handsome. You better, you better watch yourself. Those ladies are going to be flirting with you. And he just laughed and, you know, and he left and it, something happened. It was like, I felt better. Yeah. I felt better about myself by complimenting him. Yeah. And so it kind of became like a muscle that I strengthened. Nice. So in the process of me lifting him up, it made me feel better. And it, but it also made me know I needed to commit to myself. Yeah. And so a lot of times when we're in those situations with our, with our spouses or partners, or, you know, saying things that, that aren't so it's because we don't feel good about ourselves. Yeah. So you got to take care of yourself first. That's a great lesson just in life. You know, anytime we're feeling jealous, it's always, I have found it's always rooted in, I don't believe that I can have that, you know? And so when, but when we're happy for people, we're like, oh my gosh, is it, we're literally bringing ourselves into that vibra same vibration as them, you know? And anytime we're like, oh, I don't want that. We're rejecting that for ourselves. So I love that lesson in relationships and in, in life. And I've heard you guys kind of like, hallmark this like over throughout this whole episode. But, um, I, I hear from you guys both that there's been like this tremendous sense of like simultaneous personal work together, work, personal work together, work, you know, and, and I love that. I'm really, I'm learning a lot from you guys because, you know, right now I am single, I am divorced. And so it is a lot of personal work, you know, but it's really cool to see how you guys have been able to like hold this container for each other where it's like, well, nobody's going anywhere. So nobody needs to freak out and let all these patterns come out. Like I got you, I got you. I'm also going through my own stuff right now though. And that hurt. Yep. Okay. But you know, and being able to hold each other in that space is it's really cool. And I really appreciate you guys like just being so real about it and so open about it. And I, we have a little bit of time left, so I gotta, I just have to real quick talk about energy bus. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, I'm holding up the book. It's a kid's book. And I, I'm seriously, I first got started on like kids, personal development books with, um, there's a seven habits for highly effective kids yeah. book in my kids school. They use that program or, and I, like, as I was reading that book to my kids, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. Not, oh, not only am I motivated to want to read this then, but I'm remembering the stuff throughout the day and it's leveling me up. I feel good about teaching my kids that. And so I've kind of become obsessed with like personal development books for kids. So I was super excited to see that you guys have this energy bus. And I just, John, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on the energy bus and why you're writing books for kids and you know, what your mission is there. Sure. Energy Bus is a book that I wrote years ago in 2006, came out in 2007. It's my most popular book by, by far, sold over several million copies. Wow. Thank God. And that book is just about the 10 rules for the ride of your life. It's about positive energy, overcoming yeah. negativity, no energy vampires allowed. And so we had a lot of requests from schools and from teachers to nice. write a children's book. And so I wrote, I wrote one for, it's been out for years now and all yeah. these schools now read it kids use it so and cool. instead of vampires we talk about bullies no bullies allowed helping kids be grateful and focusing on the positive and overcoming the negative yeah. but then i also wrote a book called the coffee bean with a guy named damon west so now we wrote the coffee bean for kids which is teaching kids that they create their world from the inside out when you mm. put a coffee bean into hot water it's not transformed by the water. Instead, it transforms the water into coffee. Ah, oh, I love so, it. Yeah, the carrot and the egg, the carrot gets weak in the environment. The egg gets hardened in the environment, bitter and angry. Mm. The carrot gets weakened, fearful, stressed, but the coffee bean transforms. Love so it. You have the power to transform every situation you're in, every environment. You have that power. It's on the inside. So that's a powerful message for kids. And then I wrote the hard hat for kids you know, with Lauren Gallagher, uh, a former teammate's wife, who's a sports psychologist. And mm. we wrote that. And then one word for kids with my co-authors from one word. That's a lot of fun teaching kids to pick their word for the year. 
which is mm. a lot of fun. You pick your one word that's going to give you meaning and mission. Nice. Tara, this is great to do for New Year's. Like pick a word that yeah. will give you meaning and mission. And Catherine and I do it now for years. My good friends, Dan and Jimmy, have been doing it for over, over 20 years now. They're the ones who came up with this concept years ago. And we wrote a book, One Word That Will Change Your Life for Adults. But also then we did this kid's book because so many schools use it. So I love, love taking these lessons and then distilling it for teens yeah. and for kids. And the best feeling in the world is when I hear from people, hey, met you at this business conference, saw you speak there, but now we're using your work as a family. Like yeah. that, yeah. Is, that is what it's all about. Catherine and I are gonna write a family book. We wrote a marriage book. I think we're gonna write a family book in terms of you know, what we learned being parents, all yeah. the mistakes we made. And trust <laughs> me, we've made a lot of mistakes, just like we shared that in our, our marriage book. Yeah. We're going to share what we did right. And also, again, what we learned from what we did wrong. Mm -hmm. And we sat down with our kids about six months ago and they told us what we did wrong. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> it was a great conversation. They're 23 and 21. Nice. And they're like, and you know what? We're like, yeah, we owned it. Like, yeah, I wish I would have done this more. I wish I would have done that. I wish I wouldn't have mm. done this. And we want to help parents learn from our mm -hmm. mistakes. So we're going to do that at some point, you know, not, not right away. And uh, yeah, so again, it's always about just, okay, what's next? What's evolving? I'm going to write a, a leadership book for kids based on the power of positive leadership. So to nice. teach, teach kids nice. how to be positive leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so love that work. But I do want to say the last thing in relationships, it's an ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. That's one thing you have to remember. It's not the same all the time mm -hmm. and it's not always going to be the same. And it's a journey, right? So you're going to change and it's an ebb and flow. And there are times, Catherine, even to this day, like I asked her maybe like a year ago, a year ago, she was out in California on a scale of one to 10. How much do you miss me, right? On a scale of one to 10. She's like, maybe a four. <laughs> that was a big mistake, I was Tara. Like, <laughs> I was out in California having the time of my she life. Like, yeah, hanging out with her friends, like, you know, like, yeah, and, and I was like being real honest. She, she didn't miss me. I'm at home at the house. I got he's, the cats who yeah. are waking me up every she, night. She thought the four was being generous. Yeah, and <laughs> she's like, not at all. I was like, what? I'm like, okay. All right, he was I like, got it. Uh, I got it. Okay. And then, and then, like, again, just like even a month later, I'm away, and, and she's like, I just miss you so much. I wish you were like, yeah, now you miss yeah. me. Okay. So, so I feel like, I'm at like a four. Yeah, it's definitely it's never balance. <laughs> it's you know, yeah. it's more about it's kind of like there's no balance in life. I mean, exactly. you know, it's, it, there's seasons. Right. Seasons. Right. Seasons. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And you you kind of learn to appreciate the even, you know, I could talk about this with business and being on social media and stuff. And some of my friends who are getting started, they want to get like, you know, 50, you know, 5,000 more followers every day or whatever. I'm like, it doesn't work like that. Like just yeah. enjoy the slow times because when the heavy times hit, it gets crazy. So just enjoy yeah. slow, enjoy the ebbs and flows. And yeah, even with a body, body weight or fitness, it's just, it ebbs and flows. Like you sometimes you're real super into it and things are crazy. And so, enjoy the, the, the flow is definitely what I've learned. So I appreciate that. I've seen that truth in many areas of, yeah. of life. Um, okay. We are going to link all of that in the show notes. I'm assuming you have an Amazon author account, John. Yes. So I'll, I'll link that in the show notes. So you guys can find all of his books and I'll also link Catherine for real yeah. Catherine's new podcast. I'm honored to be like episode four on that. I'm so for that. honored to have you. I mean, I love Thanks. you. You know, I've been, <laughs> I mean, we've been connected for, I want to think four years. I yeah. did your keto in and out program. Yeah. I can't say that I did it successfully. That wasn't your fault. <laughs> it was mine, but now I have short-term keto, your book. Yeah. Um, I love everything that you post. I love Thanks. what you're all about. All of it. So Thank you. honored Thank to you. be here. She's been a fan a long time. Yeah. Loves your work. Thank you. And then John, what do you have a podcast as well? I do. It's positive university. Okay. And so Positive University, I've had a lot of great people like Ed Milet on and yeah. Sean McVay, the coach of the Rams and all, nice. all sorts of people. Yeah. So have to have you on as well. Yeah, Tara. we'll have to get you. Uh, have to have you on. You're I great. would love that. Please tell Ed hi. I, I call him my spirit animal of personal development. I'm like, yes. See, he, he inspires me so much. He's, He's so good at he is delivering, a delivering a message. So yeah. anyway, we'll link up all of those things that we talked about. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for being real. Thank you for helping people who aren't in the Instagram perfect relationship realize that they're actually normal and that they can heal and hold a safe space in their relationship. So thank you so much. And Tara, just, I want to let your listeners know, um, with the book, there's a free action plan nice. at relationshipgrit.com. And that's okay. a great little action plan to kind of go through. Yeah. 
Perfect. How are you communicating? We yeah. Love that. yeah. Okay. We will drop that link. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks,